You woke up this morning, checked the weather, adjusted your outfit, maybe. But have you ever stopped to think about how weather actually changed the fashion industry? Welcome to What Is It About the Weather, a podcast where we explore the many ways that weather intertwines itself into our lives. I'm your host, Mark Jelinek. Before we get talking about weather and style, hope your weather week's going well. Saw a couple of things that caught my eye. One had to do with cicadas. Now, for those who don't know what a cicada is, well, it's a little bug. You can read about it. That's the beauty of this day and age. I can actually say, Google it, and most everybody that's listening to this podcast could easily go and do that. But more or less, and I, what I do know is not all of them follow a cycle. This is a year most cicadas here in the U.S., and I don't know if this is a global thing, have a 17-year rotation. Now, there are some that don't strictly follow that, but one of the largest populations of them is on the current 17-year cycle that came up, and there tends to be a lot of them, so it's it's one of the big years, if you will. And there's so many of them. I, you know, I've seen all sorts of TikTok videos and other stuff where people, and even family members, where people don't know they're on, and then all of a sudden they notice it and they're slapping it away. But I think even President Biden here in the U.S. got tagged by one when he was leaving for the G7 summit. But they're even so prominent. There's even so many of them. And you maybe have heard me mention this before, that weather radar can pick up a lot of things, and it will pick up bird migrations. But there were a couple of episodes lately where it looks like it actually picked up some cicadas, a mass of them, around the northern Virginia area, so not not too far from Washington, D.C., for those of you who aren't familiar with the region. Thought that was kind of cool. I'm curious, what's your heat threshold? Mine got crossed this week. Not a new thing. You've heard me mention it before. Not a huge fan of the heat, but it was a stinker out there. I mean, really to the point where I didn't didn't want to go outside. So one morning, I tried this new theory. I got up and rode far enough north, right, where I could get up and, and do stuff. I got up and rode outside left home. I mean, I was up at 5 a.m., left home before 6. The park where I go and ride doesn't technically open till 6, so I I don't know if I could have ridden in there before then. I know the park itself isn't open, but the road kind of does go through it, and I I didn't even want, I didn't want to chance it. So it really wasn't too bad, but by the time I finished my ride at like, you know, just short of 7, it, it was already not where I wanted to be outside. So thankfully, tonight was out with some friends, doing things we haven't been able to do in a long while, sitting outside, enjoying some some nice air and having a glass of wine. So it didn't last too long for me, but man, I don't know. I am curious. It, you know, it's always usually the case. There's somebody that's a little more sensitive to heat, somebody a little more sensitive to cold in your household. And I'm fortunate enough where currently our, our our difference is only a couple of degrees. It's not always been the case for me. But what's your three? What's your heat threshold? Let me know. You know whether it's this or talk about tonight's topic, whatever it might be. You can always reach me right, at what is it about the weather at gmail.com. You can also find what is it about the weather on Twitter. You can find me personally, Mark underscore Jelonic. I've, I've been tweeting a little more lately, just sharing some random stuff. Of course, you can support the podcast at what is about, uh, not what is it about the weather at patreon.com slash weather. All right, let's get to the main topic. Does weather make you stylish, right? That's what we're going to be talking about. Let's talk a little bit about how we got here, I guess, first. One of the journals, and I mentioned it not too long ago because it was the first thing that kind of caught my eye. One of the journals I occasionally look at, it's not one of my main journals, but this Journal of of International Meteorology, not even meteorology, biometeorology. I'm probably getting the name slightly off because it's not one of my main journals, and it's not by one of the – a lot of times you have – you know, a group of journals that's by a certain organization like the American Meteorological Society or the American Geophysical Union or whatever it is. But this is one of those ones that's kind of ancillary for me. So, you know, every so often I'll either see something, a story about it, or I'll be in there, like happened to be the case, 
and I'll, I'll catch an article. And that's what happened. I came across an article that had to do with the whole idea of thermal comfort. And what they were looking at is it's been studied a lot, you know, talking about what's your heat threshold. It's been studied a lot about how sensitive we are, different areas of our body, right? Where heat's most well regulated by our body and maybe not so much. And you know, maybe you've experimented with this yourself. If you've ever been warm and maybe run some cool water on our, on our wrist as an area, that's an example, because our blood flow is so close to the surface there, but just running some cool water there can make you actually feel a lot cooler than if you run water over another part of the body. So we have these little zones. But what they were looking at was a little different than what's been well studied because they wanted to look at how clothing or how different fabrics related to those different zones and how you could best adjust different fabric types to maybe help the human body regulate, right? This is kind of an interesting article, link in the show notes, but it was a little techy and a little not weathery enough that I didn't want to dwell on it, but it just kind of made me start thinking about weather and fashion, right? Then, probably in the last couple of weeks, I was in New York City. And I was reminded, as we get to this, you know, everybody coming back out again, more people vaccinated here, a lot more people out on the street, outside, yeah, part of it's seasonal, but part of it, you know, a year ago, we were in heavy lockdown, right? New York was for sure. And I was reminded that in the city, there's still this kind of idea of fashion sense. Not everybody, but a lot of people... A lot of people like to do it, I think. It's not just about that they have to do it, but there's this general, you don't just go out in a pair of shorts and a t-shirt and, you know, or a hoodie or whatever it is, unless you're maybe walking the dog or, or running a quick, you know, stop to a store or something. But generally people kind of put on certain styles. Now, to the lady who was wearing a onesie that looked like a 1970s onesie, it, it still doesn't work. There's some fashion things I'll never understand. And it, it's, you know, there were plenty of people, people of all walks of life that were out there not looking, by my sense, not looking particularly fashionable that I think were trying. And I just kind of, you know, shake my head sort of stuff. Not that I'm a king of fashion or anything. But it was a reminder that, that I guess that people at least think about what they're putting on before they go outside. So it's kind of, you know, just churning those things around in my head and just thinking about fashion and weather in general. We've talked about the idea, mostly from a technology standpoint, like, you know, the idea of a raincoat or a windbreaker and how those things are made. And that's great. That's functional. But where does it cross that border into a fashion sense, if you will? And this is not a new topic, right? If you go back as an example and you look at the Little Ice Age, which was a period of about 500 years that's well documented in Europe, it was kind of during before and after what I would call the Renaissance Age, but there was this ability to create fashion that compensated for the fact that it was colder and that allows you to do a lot of things. And so the whole styling was able to include a lot of fabric and a lot of things that maybe when it's hotter or maybe when it's in the heat of the summer or like I've been in this past week, there's no way in a million years you'd put it on. But generally, for places that didn't have central air and needed to keep warm, there was these outfits that weren't just designed to be warm but were designed to do it with style, right? to create a certain look, a certain feel, to do it to make you feel good, I guess, if you had to get bundled up. That was the context. So it's not a new thing, like I said. Been going on for a while. And I also came across the idea that it's not just about what you're wearing in and of itself, but there's also this idea of how it affects the industry as a whole. There's a, a school here called the... Fashion Institute of Technology. I thought it was kind of an interesting thing. And, and what's particularly unique about it is it's one of the few places that you go in the city and there's actually a building-to-building -building connector up, you know, five or six floors 
that goes over the road. You don't see a lot of that necessarily in New York. You know, some cities you do, but it's always stood out because I remember running into where this building is. But about five years ago, they introduced a class, and specifically then it was about weather analytics. Okay. And I saw an article written about it. It was talking about the complexity of the class because it added linear regression. And I think to myself, if that's the the most complex part of things, eh, it's not all that complex. But I can understand people that aren't used to thinking about math and statistics and all those things. Eh, it, it might be a little bit more than they're used to. But they've they've kind of evolved the class to really just about analytics in general. And thinking about how analytics can help drive and shape the business and help make better business decisions. But in the context of that, whether it was this class that was purely about weather or how they've used weather now, I'll give you an example. We've all done it. We've gone into a store in January and there's swimsuits outside. Now, there's some mental think going on there to think, oh, let's get them to shop because they'll like the idea of summer's coming. But it's not necessarily the best time to do it. But what they don't want to do is they don't want to end up with leftover stock, right? End game, they don't want to have to put anything on sale. That's the ideal world. And the concept of the class is trying to help shape when it would be optimal to put certain things on display because Within the context of the way we buy things versus when we're going to use them, there really is a lot of study around that. And there's a lot of data and information they can use. So now that we're getting into the big data world and we're getting into machine learning and all those things, using the weather component of analytics makes a lot of sense. And this is an industry where it's very logical Because when we go to buy clothes, we buy them for a lot of things. We buy them for function, but we buy them to feel good and, you know, how it looks on us and all those sort of things. But we also buy them for specific activities, whether it's something like a bathing suit or maybe it's something to go skiing in the wintertime. Doesn't matter. But when's the best time to be stocking the shelves and putting those things out and making sure that you're, they're optimizing what they get out of it, right? It was cool to me to see that there's a whole sort of class around that. But it still kind of came up short. Really wasn't what I was thinking about in general. I really wanted to know, you know, does weather shape the the actual designs? Now, again, not the functional, but but the style of fashion. And I came across an interesting article that was this sort of a summary, it, it, but it was well documented. It had a lot of, again, to my show notes where I put, you know, different links you can go to. They had all their references. So it wasn't a brand new article, but what I thought was interesting is it kind of captured a lot of stuff that was really kind of cool when it came to weather. And it wasn't just about, you know, this idea of weather and fashion or, you know, the analytics or things or the functional style of things, but it got into what I like to talk about, which is a little bit of tech, a little bit of weather, and here we go, this other topic of fashion. And what they showcase in this article is actual pictures. Now, every in every case, it's kind of a dress outfit. I think there's one that's more of a coat than, than a dress, but they're all kind of female-centric things, so they're not necessarily fashion that I would go put on, but I can't see any reason that it couldn't work in the male fashion world. But they broke it down into different weather categories, which is what was really neat. So they started with air, and they profiled a dress that... You know, a lot of times when you see things added to an outfit, it's, you know, it's glued on or I don't know, you, particularly anytime, let's say you see a Christmas sweater or something that has lights on it or whatever, it, it, you know, you, you can kind of feel the wires in, in the fabric or whatever it is, but they had it, the actual stitching of this dress was able to carry a small amount of current, Right. And essentially, it's the conductor between the sensors and little LEDs that would light up. So the LEDs lit up based on the profile of air. So it was a sensor for, it happened, in this case, happened to be carbon dioxide. So it was a climate thinking dress, if you will. But the whole idea was the, the luminescence of the dress would change based on what the air profile was like when you're outside, 
It's kind of a neat idea. I don't, I don't know. I have like a home security system that has a, in addition to the security, it has like a sensor, right? That tells you temperature and humidity, but it also does air quality. And it's the same sort of thing. So these tiny little sensors on the dress, they use little Arduinos. You probably heard me mention that before, but these little tiny little sensors that are integrated with this embroidery, yet it impacts the style and what the dress looks like for the person wearing it. They had one that was this kind of neat print of a tornado scene. The whole top was a tornado, you know, kind of the big dark cloud. But towards the bottom, you see where the tornado's coming to ground. And there was the ability with these little LEDs to have a lightning effect. Not constant, but as the lighting changed where the person was, it would change the, the sensors were picking up light, right? And it would trigger different lightning within the dress. So they used a combination of things. This was at the age when digital printing was becoming a bigger thing. And I think now it's even more so. So a lot of times when we used to get prints on shirts, right? In the old day, it was a decal. It was either ironed on or, or heated on. But this digital printing allows them to do it almost within the fabric itself. But kind of like the previous dress, there was this circuitry built into it with, that would go to all these light sensors. Now, I have no idea with either one of these dresses. I can't even imagine you know, how often you might need to change the battery or how teeny tiny the battery is. But you can do a little battery. And LEDs, we get this benefit, right, that they don't use much in the way of electricity or power draw. So you can do it with a fairly small battery. There was another one that was just the idea was wind. So it had sensors that would note. And, and I think the idea here was even if the person was turning, like if they were doing a spin, right, it would sense the change in airflow. And the dress was called like daffodil or something. It was really neat. So for those that don't know what a daffodil is, I'm guessing most people do, but it's that, you know, it's a flower that has a little when it's not in its flower stage and it's when it's in its seed stage it has a little white thing up top that when you blow on it, that's when we learn about them as kids. When you blow on it, it spreads the seeds. It's great. It, it's kind of a fun thing to do as a kid, but all you do is you propagate the dandelions growing in other places. But the idea of the dress was kind of similar. So there was this little center thing that was supposed to represent the flower and it would light up. Right. But all the little tentacles were on the dress too. And the whole idea of a dandelion blowing in the wind was what the dress was representing. Then they also had one that I, I didn't think the style was particularly my thing, but I call it the puffy dress, but it was almost like a parachute dress. But the way they had designed it was it would puff up differently based on the wind direction. So literally someone could be standing outside and get this functional idea of by knowing which portion of the dress was blowing, which way the wind direction was coming from, yet it was making a fashion statement. But they didn't stop there. You go to, to idea of rain. So there was a dress as if, if you happen to be out and it was wet. You, you didn't need to avoid the wetness because the, now this dress wasn't going to last forever. But it was designed with the same coatings, if you will, that we use now for things like laundry pods or things like that. It disintegrates. It's sort of this covering. But it was done in multiple layers and with different colors. So as each one of these things dissolved, it would create a splash of different colors on the dress. And so the styling of the dress would depend on how much water got introduced to different areas. Again, kind of a neat idea. Using the tech of, of this dissolvable substance and bringing the idea of different colors into what most people, when they think of rain, think of a kind of a dull, boring scenario. So this is adding a vibrance to what might otherwise be considered kind of a dull situation. And they even had one, the final one that I saw that was kind of interesting was they called it the UV dress, right? Now, so this all has to do with sunlight, but it thought, think of this thing as being like a camera. So this, this one was a, one that looked a little more like a coat and I guess to me looked a little more far out there, like no one probably ever wore the thing. But was, the idea was neat. So they, they had these little round things, and they were different sizes. So maybe some of them were as big as, I don't know, the the base of a bowl, you know, a larger bowl. But some of them were as small as, you know, maybe a small glass or something like that. But all of them had these little things that looked like a camera lens. And the concept was, as more ultraviolet not, not just visible light, but ultraviolet light was exposed to the sensors on this dress, 
those apertures would open and close, kind of like a camera, and it changed the style. So the person literally could turn in in the sun and out of the sun and change the style of the dress. So there really is this idea of being able to incorporate weather into what we do, right? When, when, when we want to go and look stylish. Now, some of them, like I said, looked a little more stylish than others. And some of them might be a little more weather geeky type people than others. But it was just neat to me that tomorrow you could get up, right? You could take a look at what you're wearing and just remember that there's much more to the weather than the weather itself.